good morning or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. So um, this is uh, Zhi Wei Zhang. Uh, I'll be your coordinator for today's talk. And uh, as usual, before we start, I'm going to give a very brief introduction about ASPA's uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese section. And then uh, I will turn the floor to our section chair, Elin. Uh, so ASPA, so the, uh, the Chinese uh, public administration uh, was established in uh, 2000, April 2006 and it consists of scholars and practitioners from the US, China, and other countries. It is the, uh, the largest professional and scholarly organization in the field of Chinese public administration and public affairs in the US. <clears throat> so ICPA collaborates closely with Chinese public administration society and facilitates cooperation with the uh, schools of public affairs and administration in China and their counterparts in the US. So the, <laughs> the, here's the, uh, the most important part. The uh, very critical person of our section, uh, Han Jin is going to post a, uh, a link for you uh, to explore our section. And if you are not a member already, uh, Han Jin is going to let you know how to join our section, all right? So the, today's talk should last about an hour and 15 minutes. All right, so you should enter the Zoom uh, muted by default. Okay, so please only unmute yourself when you have questions. Also, uh, per uh, Dr. Mayer's request, I think it will be best if you can hold your question to the, to the uh, Q&A section. But at the meantime, feel free to utilize the chat function, all right, to post your questions with, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, within the chat function, all right. So me, Han Jin, and Eileen, we're going to uh, we're going to monitor all those questions, and uh, we can actually ask those questions for you to uh, to Dr. Mayer. All right, and uh, that's uh, that's it before we start. So uh, now let's turn to our section chair, Eileen. Uh, thank you, um, Professor John, and, and hello everybody. My name is Eileen Lu. I am a professor and uh, the director for public policy and administration at the City University of New York, uh, John Jay College. I happens to be the elected chair of the section uh, this year. Uh, here at the, uh, our section, research is a uh, core and it's in our DNA. So today we are glad to have Dr. Kim Meyer, distinguished scholar at um, the Department of Public Administration and Policy of American University with us. For those who don't know, uh, to me, Dr. Meyer is more than a distinguished professor. He happens to be one of my professors about 18 years ago. I took a public management research course co-taught by Dr. Larry O'Toole of the University of Georgia and Dr. Ken Meyer. In that course, I can tell you, he challenged every one of us very hard. His insights, way of communication, novel way of research design, his creative journal article titles, among many others, made a long lasting impact on Earth. So I certainly benefited from this. And now um, uh, I, I think this is the part even Dr. Meyer does not know because the, because the course was so challenging at that, that, that time that we as a students gathered in front of the class door and uh, discussed how many, you know, many times how we can survive the course. Um, so no wonder he is the recipient of the William Duncan Award for Excellence in Doctoral Education. So I have no question about that. <laughs> in addition to his teaching and the research, Dr. Meyer made many contributions to the field as well. Uh, so uh, he was the president of um, Public Management Research Association, uh, the Midwest Political Science Association, the Southwest Political Science Association. He is also a former editor of American Journal of P Political Science, former editor in chief of the Journal of Public Administration Research and the Theory, uh, the, uh, the founding editor of Perspectives of a Public Management and Governance, and one of the three founding editors of the recent journal, which is called the Journal of a Behavioral Public Administration. So I'm so glad to have him here tonight with us. And without further ado, I will turn the table to you know, Dr. Ken Meyer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elaine. Um, 
And thank you for mentioning the 2002 class, uh, which has always been my, uh, one of my favorite classes. Just for background, in addition to Elaine being in the class, that class had Sergio Fernandez, Sean Nicholson Crotty, Holly Gordell, Elisa Hicklin Fryer, uh, and a variety of other people who are very famous in the field today. Uh, it was an experience that was, uh, that was truly amazing. Well, today, if I might uh, share my screen, I believe this will. I uh, trust that you're seeing it. Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, I've decided to title this talk, uh, Publishing in Public Administration, Applying the Lessons of a Design Science. And my thought is that we should be able, since we are a design science interested in how things might be as well as how things are, to be able to apply those criteria to how we publish and how we go about publishing. And I'm gonna talk about those things today and use it to illustrate a half a dozen papers that I've written recently and how it fits in as to sort of give you practical lessons on how I think about this process and ways that, that you could perhaps emulate the process. And to do this, you really need to step back and ask yourself, What's valued? What's important? What can you do to make what you think is important fit within the journals that currently exist? And if you have the chance, how can you actually shape those journals in terms of what they might want? I'm gonna discuss some current research as illustrations, a set of papers on representative bureaucracy and another set on the interface of bureaucrats and the public, and there may be some general lessons. But I think it's really important here that you ask questions. They've told me I can talk for 45 minutes and I really don't wanna talk for 45 minutes. I would prefer to talk for far less. I would prefer to answer questions and deal with things that are on your mind. Since I have no ability whatsoever to multitask, uh, Elaine and the staff will be uh, taking these questions, and I hope when they see a question that's interesting, they just interrupt me and ask. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, don't worry about uh, things like hierarchy and stuff like that there. So the most important thing I want you to get out of this talk are, is theory. In fact, the three most important things are theory, theory, and theory. The way to get your publishing work or your work in print is to in fact place it theoretically. Now I'm gonna illustrate that with my own work. I study the interface of politics and administration. It's a very broad topic. How does bureaucracy contribute to effective democratic governance? From that, I've got three sub agendas, two of which I'll talk about. One is comparative public management. How general are our findings and theories? Let's be honest. We know almost everything works in Texas school districts. You shouldn't care anymore. I don't care anymore about Texas school districts. In fact, I've tried to give up writing about them completely. What we really wanna know is how this works elsewhere. How general is this phenomenon? Does it work in Latin America? Does it work in highly centralized bureaucracies? Does it work in times of organizational turbulence? What we wanna know is how general is what we know about public management. The second major question I care about is how people decide. And that's how managers decide to manage the way they do how they adopt strategy, how they decide to take risks, how bureaucrats decide what they're going to do at the street level, which clients are going to help, which clients aren't they going to help, which ones are they going to ignore, and how does the public decide what they think about government programs. I am a fan of Bayesian theory, and I think that people make decisions in that manner. 
and that's a long-term agenda. The third part, which I'm not going to talk about with any illustrations today, is what I consider the major question facing public administration today. Public administration has long had a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with politics. For those of you who somehow were told that there was once a separation of the two, I would always encourage you to go back and read the original work. Frank Goodnow never separated politics from administration. He said you had to have both functions. And he implied, and I think rightly so, that if one of those functions fails, then the whole system is endangered. And I think we're facing that situation today with a systematic failure of politics to one, set goals and priorities for public administrators, two, provide the resources they need to operate effectively, and third and most important, give them the autonomy they need to apply their professional skills to solve problems. So within this agenda, I want you to look at it the same way, but I want you to look at it in terms of your agenda. It might not be as wide ranging and crazy as mine is, but I think you need a coherent agenda. You need a focus on what you do. And your articles need to stress theory and your contributions to the theory. You should always ask before you submit any paper to a journal, why would anyone else care to read what you wrote? And if you can answer that affirmatively in terms of theory, then you should be getting better responses in terms of the reviewers and what they think of what you're doing. So let's do some illustrations of this. I wanna start with a paper that's a theoretical paper. These slides will be available as part of the uh, YouTube video, or I can uh, provide them to the, uh, to the, to the group uh, on request. Um, this paper is a complete theoretical paper. It asks a bunch of questions about representative bureaucracy, a literature that there's over 300 articles on, and points out a series of things that we don't know. In fact, I actually think we don't know more about representative bureaucracy than we actually do. Among the under unanswered questions are this, why do bureaucrats even represent people? It's not their job. Their job is defined by the organization. They're not supposed to be representing clients in anything other than a generic sense. Why would they do this? Particularly, why would they do this? In many cases, in terms of the organization, it's a risk to do it. Second, if they do decide to represent, who do they represent? Every bureaucrat has more clients to help than they can help. I pose the same thing to my colleagues in terms of mentoring. Every faculty member has more students to mentor than they can help. You make decisions in that. And third, what's the objective of representation? And I'm gonna spend some time on this because I really wanna challenge the notion that representation is about creating some advantage for individuals. And so let me go to the first empirical study, which is a study in public administration forthcoming on intersectionality and equity in higher education in the United States. It's got two theoretical frames to get you to actually care about higher education in the United States. The first frame is, what's the objective of representation? I argue in the theoretical paper that the theory of representative bureaucracy is often handicapped because some people look at this and say, you're imposing favoritism into an objectively neutral bureaucratic system. And that's wrong. On the other hand, I don't think that's what representation is doing. I think what representation is doing is trying to equalize disadvantages that are already created by bureaucracy 
and procedures. And that in fact, it's equity that individuals in the bureaucracy are seeking. They're taking out the biases, not putting them in. This is a normative question that I've been waiting for a while to engage some people in. And at the first case, I thought it'd be nice to bring some empirical data to this. To do a study of whether or not it's equity or representation, you need a case where you've got a group of people that are normally disadvantaged, but then for some reason that disadvantage disappears. And then you can see if the positive relationships between representation and outcomes continue, or if once equity is achieved, they disappear. Frame two, who is represented? Intersectionality is one of the major issues in all of social science. The person who figures out when a black female engineer working for the Department of Agriculture thinks as a black person, thinks as a female, thinks as an engineer, thinks as a member of the Department of Agriculture, or thinks today is Thursday. Whoever figures out how that process works is easily gonna win the Nobel Prize in economics and be honored by every other social science. Because if you can solve that problem, you can solve problems in political science, sociology, psychology, economics, and public administration. So a lot of people in PA talk about intersectionality, but I wanna show them how to do it right. This is the sort of attitude I have sometimes when I'm feeling sort of uppity about writing things. And indeed, uh, I think most people talking about it doing it wrong. So let me, let me tell you about the findings of this paper. We're looking for a group that is traditionally disadvantaged. We would normally look at a racial minority or females. Now, the interesting situation is this. In higher education in the United States, women are not disadvantaged. No matter what their racial group, they outperform men consistently. Graduation rates are much higher. And in fact, there are schools that put quotas on admissions because they think if the female ratio goes over 60%, then people won't go to school there anymore. So in fact, this is a case where women are advantaged. Therefore, if equity is the concern, we're gonna see no correlation between women faculty and women graduation rates. If representation is a concern, we will see a positive relationship. What we see is no relationship whatsoever. The number of women who get degrees from higher education in the United States is completely unrelated to the proportion of women faculty, no matter what level you measure it at. Frame two, intersectionality. To do intersectionality, you need to consider both the supply and demand for intersectionality. You have to know both the intersectionality of the bureaucrats and the intersectionality of the clients. And it's rare to find data sets that will tell you both of those things simultaneously. To look at half of that equation doesn't get intersectionality. So the rest of this paper essentially looks at how does gender and race combinations affect graduation rates for those combinations. And indeed, we find that the more black male faculty members, the higher the graduation rates for black males. And that's stronger than any relationship between just blacks or just males. We find the same thing for Latinas and the same thing for Latinos. The intersectionality matchup matters more than any of the individual ones. It's not the case for black females. Black females are advantaged simply by having black faculty members. And I've been looking for an explanation for that ever since we found it. Uh, and so far do not have one. So this talks about 
what bureaucrats are doing here. They're pushing for equity and they're able to deal with things like intersectionality. The question also then becomes, well, what do, what do clients want? And I'm gonna to refer to a paper that's forthcoming now in PAR with Andrea Headley and James Wright, uh, dealing with police with the subtitle, The Limits of Symbolic Representation. The frame here is this. We need a new theory of symbolic representation. As it currently exists, and there's been some just exceptional work done by Norma Ricucci and others, symbolic representation essentially holds out that the bureaucrats themselves don't have to do anything different. They just have to look like clients and clients will respond to that. And that takes every normative issue off the table involving representative bureaucracy. And so that's the question, would that actually be the case? So would I present or we present a theory of symbolic representation asking how this happens in people's heads. And it's clear from this that symbolic representation doesn't come out of nowhere. It has to have a basis in reality. And that basis in reality is, how are people treated? In other words, the argument is that symbolic representation depends on some level of active representation. If not, then we would argue that the place where people in the United States, people of color are happiest with the police force should be Washington, DC. Washington, DC overrepresents represents, Af it's got a majority African-American police officers. Very good representation of the police. We also look at the Hartford police, which is fairly represented, but not close to Washington. And here's, here's the bad news. People of color in either of those cities are not very happy with the police. They are in fact very much concerned about police and over 50% of African-Americans in Washington DC actually fear interactions with police. So the empirical part of this paper goes out and interviews people in terms of how they interact with police and what they want. Do they want to be represented? The answer is no. While they think that having police look like them is a good thing, they're not opposed to that at all. That's not what they want. They want to be treated differently than they're currently treated. Are they seeking special treatment? Representation? No. They want police to show up when they call them. And they don't want to be stopped on the street unfairly and singled out when they didn't do anything wrong. They're looking for equality. They're not looking for a representation. Okay. Another piece in the puzzle about representation and this process. Because, of course, of the section it is very important that I also have a paper from China. And so this is a paper uh, that just popped up uh, online with uh, Xiaoyang Xu and myself, separating symbolic and active representation, a mixed method study of gender and education in China. By the way, if you're looking for something interesting to tell people about this lecture tomorrow, you could say that, um, not only did I hear Ken Meyer talk, well, his second paper he covered was a qualitative paper. It had no quantitative data in it at all. And the third paper hinged completely after some quantitative data on the qualitative aspect of it. He's obviously given up statistics and he's gonna be doing research of this nature for the rest of his life. So the frame here is this. I want to know when positive results occur because of passive representation, 
Is it occurring because of symbolic representation or active representation? I wanna know if bureaucrats are doing something different or if the clients are. We're looking at China for a very specific reason and justified theoretically and empirically for that reason. Empirically, because we have a quality data set at the individual level that has both clients, students, and bureaucrats, and plenty of information. It also is a place where we can get access to the bureaucrats relatively easily and ask them questions that we're very sure give very direct, honest answers to. The second is that we found a lot of representative bureaucracy studies in a lot of countries, but most of them are from the US and Western Europe, places that have decentralized education systems where there's a lot of school choice and people voting with their feet and an external environment that's generally fairly supportive of gender equity. We contend that China does not fit those characteristics and therefore is a case that stretches the theory. The quantitative study of this is something that we already know. Girls who have female math teachers outscore girls who have male math teachers with everything else control. If you, as you're many of the people in the audience are aware of the education system, those girls who have math teachers who are also their homeroom teacher score even higher on the exams. Evidence consistent with a positive relationship between passive representation and outcomes. The interesting part of this study is the qualitative part, as we have qualitative interviews with both teachers and principals. When we approach teachers, the women teachers tell us, first of all, that they agree completely with the stereotype that girls can't do math as well as boys. Not universal, but somewhere around 80%. This is, of course, despite the fact there's no evidence that there is a difference. When asked if they do anything, that might encourage female students to perform better or teach them in any special way. They say, no, not at all. They treat all their students equally. Oh, maybe we treat them a little gentler because they're girls. Well, that might be representation. So we asked the male teachers how they treated their boys and girls. These are middle school students. And they said, well, well, equally, of course, we would never treat them any different. And by the way, boys are just much better at math than girls. Some teachers will even say, well, my class is kind of an exception, but boys are generally better at math than girls. Or my girls are good at memorizing, but they, they're, they're not getting the math concepts. Now, that indicates that teachers really aren't doing anything. Though I wanna come back to that equal treatment. And then we interview principals and that's where we get just an incredible shock. We thought some of the teacher's attitudes were pretty sexist, but they are nowhere close to what the principals think. The principals have a clear preference that men should be teaching math and science. Women should be teaching humanities, Chinese and English. One female principal said, and this is virtually a quote, if I have a choice between hiring a man or a woman with absolutely equal credentials for a math position, I will hire the man because that's the way society intends it. And so the qualitative interviews have got to be pointing in the direction that there is no active representation. 
what is going on? Because we then have quantitative data on the students. And this quantitative data shows that girls with female teachers perceive their teachers are more likely to pay attention to them, perceive they're more likely to call on them in class, perceive they're more likely to praise them. And these girls also spend more time studying math and they're less likely to accept the stereotype that boys are better than girls at math. We're working on seeing how general this is because our argument here is, if in fact girls are being treated as equals in math classes in China, perhaps that's better than how they're treated everywhere else. And what's interesting here is we now have a set of qualitative interviews in India which show pretty much the same thing. And we're hoping to supplement that, and I'll talk about this in a minute with a set of other interviews that uh, we'll see how generalizable that is. Now, here's the next slide, which I should have done in two slides, which is, okay, you've seen where I've been. Where am I going next? This is a question I love to pose to my students. What's the next item on the agenda? Or alternatively, when I say, I want you to run the following data, but I want when you come back to tell me why I asked you to run that. I want you to put your brain in my head and see what happens. So where I'm going next on these things is true cross-national studies. We are within a week or two of building a data set with over 60 countries and eight time periods on individual level data. And we're gonna use that to deal with how this relationship changes over time. I believe the first paper we'll tackle is this. I'm very curious if there's a relationship between democracy in a country and bureaucratic representation. And I'll probably figure out an interesting title to use for that. I'm also very interested in how the policy environment affects active and symbolic representation. Whether people who get represented see a payoff to this, see that they have professional opportunities open up, whether they have political opportunities open up. Uh, we've got cross-sectional data on multiple countries that show that, but it'd be very nice to be able to show that happening over time within countries. We're also moving to questions of how representation across institutions matter. That is, does education in the bureaucracy, or I'm sorry, representation in the bureaucracy, is that enhanced by having representation in a legislature or in other executive agencies? Our preliminary indications are, this data from India, that yes, it is. That in fact, there is a relationship that feeds off of each other. Why it exists, we don't know at the present time, but we do know it's there. And then we're going to continue the India-China qualitative cross-national work to find two additional cases. Neither India nor China is a country that we see as high on a gender equity list. So we're going to do the United States, and then we're going to do the Netherlands, which is uh, clearly much higher on a gender equity list, to see if the same relationships hold. Now, I'm going to shift to talk about public bureaucratic interactions, but if there are questions today, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, Dr. Meyer, um, so my my question is, how do you see um, Asian American uh, representation and you know in your representative uh, representation studies? Because um, most of the work we have seen so far is is, is more about 
uh, African American and Latino, you know, uh, and the gender. But um, what's the what's your sense of the situation here with Asian American representation studies? That that is just a wonderful question, uh, in part because um, it it forces us to face a major empirical and theoretical issue. And that is this. One, the uh, government of the United States doesn't like to collect data in any other way than the generic category, Asian and Pacific Islander. Okay. The concept and if I can say this correctly, the concept Asian American is a concept that only exists in America and only because Asians moved to America. Because they came from vastly different countries, vastly different cultures, vastly different contexts. And the experiences of a Chinese American are so vastly different than the experience of a Hmong American that grouping them together just doesn't make sense to me, right? Uh, this requires for it to work at that level of gener generality, a pan-Asian identity. Now, I was one of the skeptics that there would ever be a pan-Latino identity, and there appears to be one that has developed separate from being Mexican-American, Cuban-American, et cetera. But I think the, the real, breakthrough in studying this is to be able to find data that will give you enough fine-grained detail to look at how immigrants from South Asia are doing right now versus how immigrants from Japan who have been here 150 years are doing, which are got to be two different educational experiences in the process. And so I'd love to study it. I'd love to see the data set for that. I have these conversations uh, with my own students about this and I'm you know, very cognizant of the, 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 national difference, this, the national difficulties or difficulties with it. Now that aside, you ask the other part of this question, which is really very interesting, which is because that's how the concept Asian American, I think, reflects to an Asian American. But to somebody who's not Asian, he thinks you're all alike, right? That they can't distinguish between Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, Hmong, or whatever. And therefore, they're trying to force people into a common identity and the sort of discriminatory processes, I think, uh, play off on that. Um, but it's an incredibly interesting question. Um, and I would love to be able to get a data set, perhaps the New York City schools, uh, where you could, you could get the student data. The question is whether or not there's enough teacher representation to pay off. Because in fact, you know, it was the, as an illustration, so just so you know that all of my projects don't turn out, you're probably thinking that everything I write gets published. No, 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 no. Um, I had this wonderful study to study uh, Latinos in new destinations, like states that uh, they weren't normally going to. So they're going to North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Indiana, and I was going to relate political representation and teacher representation and performance. And guess what? There are no Latino teachers in those areas. And not only that, there are no Latino elected officials either. And there won't be for another 25 years if common patterns sort of hold. And so um, those types of studies don't get done. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that they they don't have advocacy and representation. In fact, if anybody really wants to do some incredible stuff, they should do the representation that nonprofits are doing for immigrant communities in the United States. In every major city, there's a nonprofit that's putting together multiple government and non-government programs 
to service the immigrant community and has got far better outreach than anything the government would ever imagine. Incredible stuff. Um, be a great study to do. Is there another question? Thank you. There's not another question. Okay. I will move on to the next item, which is the uh, agenda between public and bureaucratic interactions. There's a lot of arguments that the general public really isn't very good at evaluating government programs, that they have no idea a good program from a bad program. If so, that creates a real problem for democracy because we want these people voting intelligently and we want them holding uh, elected officials accountable. And so I wanna talk about a set of studies here and how their positions take advantage of that. The first one is with Min Song and I uh, on um, government performance schools again in Korea. And the thing I, like people to do when they read this paper is first ask, why Korea? Korea was chosen for a very specific reason. Every study of representative bureaucracy up to that point had been done in a decentralized country where people have a choice of where they can go to school and they vote with their feet. And these are all highly individualized countries where in fact, TIBU models of economic rationality should apply. So let's pick a place where that doesn't occur. And Korea is a very nice place because it runs a very centralized education system. And in fact, you don't have any choice. Not only don't you have any choice, when it's time to go to high school, you get randomly assigned to a high school in your metropolitan area. Man, for example, was assigned to go to a Catholic girls' school. Man is not Catholic. It was an interesting experience for her. In addition, to keep from having school effects overwhelming and be socioeconomic status, teachers are rotated from school to school every four years. Principals are rotated every eight years. So it takes out a lot of the variables that make the US system work in this way. Second, this is a data set where we will know the individual grades of the students. And so we'll be able to judge whether parents are evaluating the quality of schools or the quality of education for their child. Okay. We'll also be able to look at the interrelationship between parent, teacher, and even student evaluation. So it's, a, it's a marvelous data set. The findings are very interesting. That is, there is a representation of and that representation effect is very strong, but the representation effect is driven by the evaluation of the schools, not the evaluation of how well their child is doing. In other words, it's a very communitarian evaluation. It's not the sort of thing that the economic models are based on where you vote with your own child on where to send them. You're looking for a school that is good overall. If your child does well, that enhances your evaluation. If your child doesn't do so well, well, it doesn't. The other thing that this shows here is that you can look at how nicely interact related parent, teacher, and student evaluations are, and you can pull the test scores out of that relationship, and they're still related in a reciprocal pattern, which means parents, teachers and students see something valuable in the education they get separate from test scores. And those evaluations reciprocally affect each other. Now, 
one of the questions, if you decide you're going to go and then determine that the public can judge programs, is there's a whole literature out there already that says, well, there's a bias against public programs. That people think public programs are bad, even when they're not bad. And as a result, um, you know, you really can't can't believe what, what people say. So I want to look at that directly. And this deals with a paper that came out a year or so ago in public administration. And I'm using it for a couple of reasons. This is a replication of a study that was done in Denmark. If you want to see how to do a replication of a study and get it in print in a good journal, this is a good role model because it shows you how to set up such a case. The authors of the Danish study, who are good friends of mine, uh, Simone Palmer Anderson and uh, um, Ul Ulrich Hortzkopf, um, found a very strong anti-public sector bias in Denmark involving hospitals and contended that that was the tough case. Denmark had this huge public sector and they should be really happy with this and they shouldn't ever hate government. And if it's this bad in Denmark, imagine how disgusting it's gonna be in the United States. So why not look at it? And so we do look at it. We try to correct a couple of other things methodologically, but none of the methodological glitches uh, matter. That is, they use students and we use both students and adults and get the same things. But when we look at this, we discover that in fact, there's no bias in the United States at all. Theoretically, the bias should show up in the US if it shows up anywhere. It doesn't. And then that becomes now an interesting question. Why doesn't it show up? And we talk about reasons why it doesn't show up and the difference between Denmark and the United States. And in fact, uh, it's really surprising it shows up in Denmark because 97% of hospital beds in Denmark are government run. Nobody uses a private hospital in Denmark unless they have a lot of money and they don't want to wait in line for their operation. Whereas in the United States, only 20% of hospitals are public. You'll notice if you read that paper, and I would encourage you to read the conclusion carefully, the conclusion specifies all sorts of interesting limitations that if you look at it, you're saying, oh, Ken's just telling you what he's gonna study next. And therefore he can cite this paper for the next one. And let me give you an illustration. The flaw in both of these studies is they compare public to private hospitals. The dominant form of hospitals in the United States are nonprofit. They're not only the dominant form, they're the best hospitals by objective standards. So we do a follow-up study to show that um, what, whether there's a bias in nonprofit hospitals. Uh, it's a very quick article and it shows that, no, not there either. Why doesn't it show up? My general reaction is, I don't think people pay any attention to who runs the hospital. Alternatively, I'm not sure they even know. There's a marvelous study of nursing homes, of people who have selected nursing homes for their parents. And they follow up by asking them if the nursing home is public, private, or nonprofit. By private, they mean for-profit. And two thirds of the people could not correctly identify who owned the nursing home they placed their parents in. Not a salient issue. We've replicated this study in nursing homes ourselves in food security programs and found no bias. One of my PhD students has replicated it for US universities and has found a bias, but the bias is against for-profit universities. 
And objectively, that's fair. For-profit universities in the United States are, quite frankly, terrible. And they're even terrible after they closed down Trump University. She also discovered that there was a bias in housing programs, but it wasn't anti-government. It was pro-nonprofit. People think housing programs should be nonprofit. So I've got a few generic things to say about publication. And then you have to come up with questions to entertain us for the next 25 minutes. OK. I think it's very important, and I'm aware of the group I'm talking to, to exploit context. You are very lucky. Many of you are studying a country that's different from other countries assuming you're studying China. That's a good thing. You just have to make an argument why it's theoretically interesting. Alternatively, find a co-author from another country and run two country studies on the same thing. If I can publish papers comparing Texas schools to Danish schools, I'm sure that there are institutions in China that are more important that could be compared to others. You want to exploit the context. There are good comparative theories about why organizations should do different things in different environments. There's a big payoff there. Second, target journals specifically. I like to say I never write a paper without an idea of which journal I want it published in. I know that if I'm thinking public administration review, that I have to explain why it's got implications for practice. If I don't have that, there's a bias against it. They might still accept it, but I don't, I don't really want to play that game. Um, other journals have other biases, depending on what they like to publish and what they like to do. And so crafting for a journal, I think, is very important. I think it's really a waste of time starting at one journal and just going through the whole cycle when you catch them all. Um, it's very inefficient. Third, um, it's really important uh, to get feedback before you submit carefully craft the manuscript, edit it carefully. Um, I've always discovered that if I spell two words wrong, people think I've spelled 15 wrong. If I make one grammatical error, they think I've made 25. And so it needs to be edited, it needs to be cleaned. The default option for every journal is to reject your manuscript. It's just the, the, the logic, right? They get, they get, uh, five to 10 times more manuscripts they can publish. So you never want to give them an excuse on something other than the quality of the manuscript. Now, this is the one thing I'm going to say that all the other editors always cringe when I'm on a panel with them. You need to learn to evaluate feedback. You will get good reviews or reviews from good reviewers and reviews from bad reviewers. And it's important for your career to be able to distinguish between the two of them. It's quite possible that you'll get three reviews from a journal that might not be very good, might not have understood what you did. They might give you interesting things to do, but they might suggest a lot of things that are wrong or irrelevant. And I can give specific examples of that. Um, and so you need to be able to evaluate the feedback and be able to sort of judge that. Because I like to say, you need to develop a bit of an ego to be able to have faith in your own work and to judge good feedback from bad feedback. And always be aware that in a sample of three, the level of error is massive. And that's what review processes are. They're samples of three. 
and you need to be able to evaluate feedback. One of the problems I find a lot of students have is they take all feedback seriously. And so they immediately turn a nice tight 18 page paper into a 57 page tome that makes absolutely no sense at all because they've related to everything from Aristotle to public service motivation to what day it is in Afghanistan. Finally, I think it helps to pick a field that's less populated. So something, yeah, I, I should just say that. There are 500 people examining public service motivation. I don't think the odds you're gonna find something new on public service motivation are all that good. On the other hand, there are only 10 people looking at emotional labor. Figure it out, right? There are much more opportunities there. Um, you know, my other examples, um, I really like to study turnover in organizations, but I study turnover as an independent area. I wanna know what difference it makes for performance. I don't care why people leave. I want to know why it matters if they leave. That's a field that's less populated. Representative bureaucracy. You could study it in the United States, where everyone does, versus almost anywhere else. It's more interesting in those other countries. Or you could study public management using the US Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey or you could study public management in any other data set. Too many people using the same data set. Um, the one lesson, if you look at the agenda Larry O'Toole and I did together, was essentially that we built a data set over a 20 year period and gradually improved the data set, improved the data set. And quite frankly, it wasn't a particularly good data set when we started, but we made the investments, we added to it, we had good theory. And now it's such that, you know, I constantly, it's irritating, it's actually irritating. I get all these manuscripts to review on Texas education. Um, and I don't know who wrote them because I'm not doing anything on it anymore. My students basically aren't doing it anymore. We've given the data set to everybody. Um, but they're still, they're still getting interesting things out. So that's really all I have to say. <laughs>